1978, a mysterious painting is unearthed in a London auction house. A picture that might have been painted by the world's most famous artist, Leonardo da Vinci. Now science and art history come together to find the truth. The discovery of a new Leonardo, it's like discovering a new planet. The Holy Babies, a 500-year-old master, or is it a fake? To find a new one would be a, a cataclysm. Behind the Holy Babies is a story that penetrates to the very heart of Christianity. Its real meaning could be as heretical as any fictional Da Vinci Code. Just before Christmas, 1978, a Dutch art dealer and his sister go to a private viewing of minor paintings at a London auction house. What happens next will change their lives forever. To go through the window, and then on the window, still there was some sunlight. I looked in a certain angle, and the light came on a special way on the picture. And then I looked at it, and I said, Gosh, there's another landscape underneath of it. What sort of landscape was hidden beneath the layer of black paint was unclear. But there was more. Removing the loose parchment on the back of the painting, Robert uncovered the most prized name in the history of art. And I saw very vaguely written, 39 Leonardo. Then I thought, I have to have this. He quickly sealed it back up, hoping nobody else would see what he'd seen. The next morning, Robert went to the sale. Eight hundred, nine hundred, one thousand. That is some kind of lull in the bidding. And then it was hammered towards me. Robert believed he might have just bought the holy grail of the art world, a lost painting by the world's most famous artist, Leonardo da Vinci. And he had bought it for only a thousand pounds. He was convinced he'd seen a landscape under the dark overpaint. So he took it to the National Gallery's Arthur Lucas, then one of the world's most experienced art conservators. I said, there's a landscape underneath of it. And he said, my foot. That's what he said to me. Then he did a probe and then he said, very rare, he says, there is a landscape underneath of it. So then he said, I'm going to clean it. Lucas carefully removed the overpaint to reveal an extraordinary vision. The holy babies John the Baptist and Christ were seated within a small rocky grotto and framed by twisting vines of ivy, ferns, violets and anemones. And when I saw the picture, I said, this is something very special. And it is something so special that I will devote part of my life of it. But it was the flowers that especially caught the conservator Arthur Lucas's eye. The flora are painted to the highest quality equal to those in the Virgin of the Rocks in the National Gallery. The Virgin of the Rocks is attributed to none other than Leonardo da Vinci and his studio. It's among the least likely things to be found in the whole spectrum of the art world. There are perhaps a dozen works by this artist in the world. To find a new one would be a, a cataclysm. Next, he took the painting to the world's top Leonardo experts. They confirmed Arthur Lucas's assessment. But even with all this support, the art world refused to recognize this painting as a Leonardo. 
The reason is simple. The holy babies was a popular motif throughout Europe in the 16th and 17th centuries. These paintings are known as Leonardesque, paintings in the style of Leonardo, but not by him. But is there a lost original by Leonardo himself? This image must have existed in some form important enough to have been given as a gift or to have been visible somewhere where many people could have copied it. In 1978, the Holy Babies was believed to be one of these copies, but it could also be the original Leonardo. Now, 28 years later, Robert is going to try again. The Holy Babies has been kept under lock and key in a London bank vault. But now it's being moved to a laboratory which will subject it to a battery of scientific tests. Robert hopes that revolutionary 21st century technology will authenticate the painting and prove the art world wrong. Joining Robert on his mission is his nephew, Marcus. He's definitely determined to prove this painting is da Vinci, and he has good reason. Identifying who painted a picture, a procedure called attribution, is traditionally a long process fraught with difficulties, controversy, and even corruption. Without attribution, many paintings are simply worthless. When you can't identify the hand that made them, they take on no market value except maybe a vague aesthetic value. In the 19th century, as many as 90 paintings were claimed as being by Leonardo. But today, experts put the figure between 15 and 25, depending on who you speak to. To make matters worse, dubious claims are made all the time. This recent exhibition in Italy claims to include two new Leonardos, but few believe them to be authentic. Weight works that just appear on the market, of which we don't know anything from the historical sources. We don't know who owned them and through which channels they appeared. They will always be controversial. If a picture is by Leonardo, then it's worth uh, a fortune. If it's a replica or if it's a fake, it's worth nothing. Not one of the paintings in this exhibition has been subjected to the rigor of scientific testing, nor have they been accepted by the art establishment. But in the old master field, this is a nightmare of dealing with attributions, an absolute nightmare. By subjecting his prized painting of the Holy Babies to the accepted authentication process, Robert is risking everything. The discovery of a new Leonardo is a, a really a major event. It's like discovering a new planet. Robert is on the threshold of either making one of the greatest discoveries of 21st century art, or seeing his lifetime's dream shattered. Will the scientists discover a genuine Leonardo or a clever fake?
The Holy Babies, a painting that could be by Leonardo da Vinci, has arrived at a scientific laboratory for the first phase of the attribution process, image diagnostics. The scientist in charge of testing, Dr. Nicholas Eastor, begins by inspecting its condition. If it's too damaged, there may be no point in continuing. When I first look at painting, I'm really looking for things that are going to affect uh, how I carry out the scientific analysis. I'm not looking at it stylistically, subjectively. But science alone is not sufficient. Attributing a picture to a painter also requires the eye of a recognized art connoisseur. You already started having a look, I see. I have, yes. Professor Martin Kemp of Oxford University is an authority on Leonardo's painting technique and style. And he's only too aware that these tests could shatter Robert's dreams forever. This, for me, is a historical investigation, and I will produce the evidence as I see it. And if an owner comes to me and says, as happened in the case of this, I want to follow up the scientific tests and find out the truth of the painting, I will say to them, you realize, do you, that at any point this whole thing can collapse. Ultimately, gaining acceptance for the attribution of this picture to Leonardo or not will largely rely on Professor Kemp's respected testimony. In the newspapers, you hear of an attribution, a newly discovered work by a major Renaissance master, and you read down and you discover that you've never heard of the expert who has discovered it, and that makes alarm bells ring in my mind. Whereas, if Martin Kemp were to say, look, this is a new Leonardo, or we, I, we have every reason to believe that we've discovered a new Leonardo, By using ultraviolet light, the experts can effectively peer back through the centuries to see where the paint has been altered from its original state by retouching or restoration work. Yeah, it's nice, it's like seeing the old war wounds, isn't it? It is, <laughs> it's like, yes. like The a, battles a, it's been through. Like a veteran who feels his, uh, his joints creaking, we can see where the damage has been. That's yeah, it. It's pretty yes. nice. Yes. And, yeah, so the verdict for a patient who's four or five hundred years old is quite a good state of health. I would have thought so, yes. <laughs> the painting has passed the first critical hurdle. The ultraviolet light analysis has revealed that it's in good enough condition to continue with more detailed scientific testing. Science can tell us when and where this picture was painted. Connoisseurship might tell us who painted it, but neither can tell us why. Was Leonardo even interested in this theme? The clues are to be found in his life story. On the 15th of April, 1452, Leonardo was born in the hills above the tiny provincial town of Vinci in Tuscany. He grew up in the country and was to some extent a self-educated young man. This indeed could be seen as having a profound influence on the kind of man and the kind of thinker he became. The quiet country boy was soon to be transformed by an emerging intellectual and artistic revolution. He moved to Florence and joined the busiest and most respected art studio in the city, run by master artist Andrea del Verrocchio. Leonardo was introduced to Verrocchio's studio by his father as uh, a pupil and apprentice of Verrocchio and who therefore launched Leonardo on his career as an artist. Leonardo's apprenticeship began during an era of immense change. Florence was the center of a new way of thinking. An ideology of revolutionary thought that harked back to the republican virtues of ancient Greece and Rome. It was transforming the intellectual landscape. A culture of grace, art and beauty, of music, science, and new ways of understanding man and God. It was called the Renaissance. 
When you look at a picture in the late 15th century, uh, you, can, you can actually f almost feel the weight of a figure. Now, this is the kind of thing that we call the Renaissance. A sort of sense that images, that naturalism is much more important. It's not at all that we've lost sight of God and religion, but that we have a new way of visualizing things. This cultural revolution found a natural affinity in the developing genius of Leonardo. And under Verrocchio's strict tutelage, he learned his craft. Forget the solitude of the garret. There's a lot of activity. There's apprentices fetching and carrying, grinding colors, preparing panels. There's a smell of solvents and oils. Verrocchio soon recognized Leonardo's talent. And it's this relationship that highlights the difficulty of attribution. Because in the Renaissance, almost all paintings were in part painted by the master's pupil. He had a lot of people working for him, and they were working for the master in the style of the master. In many cases, it wasn't done by one painter. It, it was done by one painter plus assistants in the studio. So the attribution becomes a very complicated and difficult matter. Verrocchio supervised a team of artists for his larger commissions. In this picture, the baptism of Christ, Leonardo is known to have painted the angel on the left, whilst his master, Verrocchio, handled the other on the right. The odd thing about Verrocchio is we have paintings we call Verrocchio paintings, but I think there's almost none which we can say confidently this is all Verrocchio's own work. The first picture attributable to Leonardo was completed in 1472. The Annunciation. It had a traditional subject, the Archangel Gabriel revealing to Mary that she will bear the Messiah. But Verrocchio's ideas heavily influenced the picture. There is nothing in that picture, in a sense, which you can't find as a, a Verrocchio studio prop. So it's got very Leonardo characteristics, but essentially it's a Verrocchio and co picture. Who really authored this picture? Leonardo, who did much of the brushwork, or his master Verrocchio, who created its themes? What defines a painting by Leonardo is at the core of this investigation. In the National Gallery in Washington is the picture in which the real Leonardo as artist begins to emerge. The Ginevra de Benci. The painting's strange luminosity and minute attention to detail mark it out as a personal artistic revolution. No one had ever painted like this before. You have that sense with the Ginevra painting for the first time in Leonardo's output. There's a sense of sort of world one's looking into, which you're not part of because you're out here, but th through that frame you kind of go in and it's a sort of dream world. It was only in 1967 that the Ginevra was confirmed to be a Leonardo. Before the National Gallery purchased the painting for $5 million, then the highest price paid for any picture, they had to prove that Leonardo authored it. The attribution had been in doubt because I don't think too many people had seen the painting at that time in the 60s. It wasn't in a public collection like the Louvre or the National Gallery in London or somewhere like this where it was very easy to see it. It was in this private collection. And so there were doubts about his attribution at the time. There are no doubts whatsoever about his authorship now. Searching for clues about the techniques Leonardo used to paint the Ginevra, the US National Gallery decided to subject it to a series of scientific tests. One of them was infrared reflectography, a test which the Holy Babies is about to undergo. 
Dr. Eastor uses this test to reveal underdrawings, the preparatory sketches underneath the paint layers. If he finds nothing, the painting may be a copy. I suspect there is some weak indications of underdrawing. We can see some faint lines running round the wrist through here. The faintness of the underdrawings is not encouraging, but it need not rule out the holy babies as a Leonardo. When the US National Gallery conducted its infrared analysis on the Ginevra, they too found few underdrawings. I think being just a simple portrait, a straightforward portrait, I don't think there was any adjusting of the drawing. But a straightforward portrait like this, no, there aren't many alterations that you would do in the, in the drawing. You might do them in the painting itself, but not in the drawing. Validating the painting as a Leonardo relies on more than just science. The key tool of an art connoisseur is a picture's provenance, the history of who owned the painting and how it came into an owner's hands. Outside Oxford University, Robert waits nervously for his first meeting with Professor Kemp. The problem is, when Robert Balleur bought the Holy Babies, it didn't have a provenance. This was an important reason why the painting was not authenticated 28 years ago. Ever since, Robert has worked tirelessly to trace its previous owners. Now he must subject his findings to the scrutiny of Martin Kemp. I feel a little bit, uh, it is the hour of truth, eh? that after nearly 28 years of research, finally someone wants to hear you. You feel like almost like you, that you are shouting in the desert and nobody wants to hear you. That is what I felt for years. Robert believes he can trace his picture of the Holy Babies back to Leonardo's workshop. But if Professor Martin Kemp is unconvinced, 28 years of research will have been in vain. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, how wonderful that I can see you finally. It's now very nice to meet you. Robert Buller. Mm, nice pleased to meet, to meet you, Martin Kemp. Welcome to Oxford. Thank you. Uh, have you done this work yourself? Yes, Investigating I did. it? Yeah, it's yes, terrific. Yes, I did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it's it need, finding a needle in a haystack. It is. Um, provenance research is, needs time. Needs it's time, a, and it has also needs also a, some luck that you find it. It yeah. needs time, luck, and obsession. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Well, for me as a historian, um, in provenance research, the key moment is the Aldo Brandini inventory, the 16-3 one. When Robert began his search to find the provenance, he had only one clue, the number on the back panel. It meant that the painting had once been listed in an inventory, but which one and where? Everybody thought I was crazy because they said to me, you will never find it. That's impossible that you find this, because where must you look? It took Robert over 30 trips to Italy to find the key to the inscription. A trail of painstaking research that led him to the Villa Aldo Brandini in Frascati. Today, it's the ancestral home of one of Italy's oldest noble families. And it was here, in their vast and ancient archive, that he found the crucial clue. I saw so many names here. So I said, God, help me just to find it out. And I, my finger fell down, and then I found the Alde Brandini's. And I said, ah! <laughs> I found it, you see. Everybody looking at <laughs> finally. And I find it. Robert had discovered the record, number 39, by Leonardo da Vinci, exactly as is inscribed on the back of his painting. It came with a description. Due putti che si baciano insieme, di Leonardo da Vinci. Two infants kissing by Leonardo. It also describes something extraordinary, the size of the painting. Alto palmi due. Two palms tall. A palm was an old measuring unit from the Renaissance period, about 30 centimeters long. Two palms measure the exact size of Robert's painting. This 1603 reference precisely matches the Holy Babies. 
and with this record, Robert appears to have established a significant part of the provenance. But will Martin Kemp agree? That is something which is rather rare to have both a an inventory and then to have the number on the back which all corresponds and ties up. That's, yes. uh, that's enormous good fortune. But Robert's good fortune is only a qualified success. By the 17th century, there were hosts of Leonardo's in Italian and other collections, and uh, these were just listed by people doing inventories. Therefore, we will say it's Leonardo, so there's a lot of ambitious attribution going on. The Aldo Brandini archive also contains records of four other Leonardo's, of which there is no trace today. Either the paintings have been lost, or they have since been attributed to other lesser artists. The other dimension, Robert, which is a kind of cautionary tale, is that looking at these major inventories, how many Leonardo's there are in the 163 inventory, I think there are four other Leonardo's. Yeah, four other Leonardo's, yeah, which, which are no Leonardo's. Which are not Leonardo's, so uh, it's, it's terrific to have the provenance, but uh, yes. there's a lot more work to do, obviously, but so yes. at least the first step is on the ladder, as it were. Yes. Um, it's interesting. Robert has satisfied Professor Kemp that the Holy Babies was in this famous collection. But can it be traced back to Leonardo? Robert thinks he knows how. If he's right, the discovery will make him a millionaire many times over. If he's wrong, three decades of hard work may come to nothing. Much will depend on a new line of inquiry, the iconography. It may even expose heretical ideas encoded within the holy babies.
Art dealer Robert Boller is trying to reconstruct the provenance, the history of ownership, of a painting called the Holy Babies. He believes it's a lost Leonardo, and after 28 years of research, he has good reason. Incredibly, he has traced the picture to an inventory in the Aldo Brandini archive in Italy. Here, he found that it could be part of a collection bequeathed to Cardinal Pietro Aldo Brandini in 1598. Now Robert needs to trace it further back in time to Leonardo's workshop. The painting is believed to have been given to the Aldo Brandinis by a noblewoman called Lucrezia d'Este. Her motive was revenge. As a young lady, her lover was brutally murdered by her brother. And so on her deathbed, she signed over her entire estate to the Aldo Brandinis, her family's sworn enemy. There is a direct link between Lucrezia d'Este and Leonardo. The artist once worked for her family. The connection begins after he set out for a new life in Milan in 1482. Leonardo had been invited to the palace of Lucrezia d'Este's great uncle, Duke Ludovico Sforza. The new ruler of Milan, Sforza had grand ambitions for the city. He had a genuine desire to create a cultural identity for Milan, which he felt that Milan didn't actually possess. And Leonardo's position at court in Milan was sort of part of that desire to, uh, as it were, drag Milan up market. Leonardo thrived in Ludovico's court. Here he was a musician, storyteller, jester, and all-round Renaissance man. But there was a sinister side to Ludovico's generous patronage. Ludovico was nouveau riche. His grandfather was a mercenary commander, and despite appearances, he was only the acting ruler of Milan. The true heir was his ten-year-old nephew. Ludovico Maria Sforza and his wife Beatrice d'Este were not the Duke and Duchess of Milan there. The real Duke was this young boy, and yet he was consistently kept away from power by his uncle. Leonardo spent the next 18 years as the protege of the Duke. The ephemeral quality that defines a Leonardo was to emerge fully formed in his Milanese studio. He perfected a new style, a technique called sfumato. It used a revolutionary medium, oil paint, in a way that had never been seen before. He is in the first generation of painters that really successfully uses the oil painting as the primary medium. So Leonardo is already beginning to exploit the poetic sort of uh, qualities of oils, that uh, ind in indefinite quality, what he comes to call his sfumato technique. Sfumato means blended or smoky, and its effect on a painting is to subtly blur lines, creating a greater sense of depth, color, and form. Leonardo developed the technique by immersing himself in the natural world. Here he studied the complexities of human perception, particularly of light and shadow in different conditions. He noted how people and objects became silhouetted when lit by the sun behind them. How motion distorts and the effect of extreme glare and deep shadow. The result is an intense form of naturalism, a sort of supernature. The eye, which is called the window of the soul, is the chief means whereby the understanding may most fully and abundantly appreciate the infinite works of nature. 
Leonardo stresses experience. Anything he couldn't experience, he didn't believe. So he was great on something that was tangible, visible, smellable, tasteable. You know, he, he relied upon sensory knowledge and you extracted knowledge from nature by looking at it, above all. The Holy Babies uses sfumato. But whether the effect was achieved using the same technique pioneered by Leonardo or by a later development of the method will require a scientific analysis of the painting's deep structure. Searching for clues, Dr. Nicholas Eastor now begins examining the picture using radiography. That's looking excellent. You can see in x-rays directly evidence sometimes of, of particular techniques that were used at, uh, at particular times. This is really revealing deeper aspects of the technique. For example, an imitator or copyist uh, might get the surface of appearance of a painting, but not necessarily the, the deep structure, the, the underlying technique. And therefore, paintings that are superficially similar in X-ray may look very different. These X-ray images suggest to Dr. Eastor that the deep structure of this painting is consistent with the Renaissance artwork making it unlikely to be a fake or modern copy. Probing deeper using microscopy, Dr. Eastor now explores the composition of the paints themselves. The first thing he notices is in the hair of the infants, a pigment called lead tin yellow. We call it lead tin yellow. To Leonardo it would have been giallolino. It has this very peculiar history in that it disappeared entirely early on in the 18th century. And of course, because of this, this loss of knowledge about it, it's a powerful dating pigment for us. The discovery of lead tin yellow is a breakthrough. It's the first solid evidence that the painting dates back to before the 17th century. But the real test will be an analysis of the paints and glazes used to achieve Leonardo's famous sfumato technique. Leonardo would use glazes of black over the top to tone it down, give it a sfumato. So something else that I'm looking for is evidence that washes a black pigment. The age and type of pigment used in the sfumato is critical. Leonardo pioneered the technique but many other later artists copied and modified it. The initial indications are encouraging. There's actually quite a lot of, what's well, probably charcoal actually, it's the type of thing that we would expect to have been used by that circle. The fact that the pigment was used by Renaissance artists like Leonardo is excellent news for owner Robert Boller. But as well as the scientific analysis, and Robert's attempt to reconstruct the painting's lost provenance, there is a third, far more esoteric strand to the investigation. This is called its symbology, the ideas embodied in the painting. Is the motif of the holy babies something that Leonardo would have painted? His first independent commission in Milan was for a religious confraternity. Leonardo was asked to portray a conventional scene of the Madonna and Child in the central panel of an altarpiece. Instead, he painted an entirely different scene, the mysterious and enigmatic Virgin of the Rocks. The picture is a decisive piece of supporting evidence because it shows that the Holy Baby's motif was one Leonardo himself painted. What is less clear is the reason why. The Virgin Mary and baby Christ are flanked by John the Baptist and the Archangel Uriel. The Virgin of the Rocks is a hermetic painting in the sense that it has a secret which one can never quite get to. What exactly is being depicted? What exactly is the symbolic meaning of what's being depicted? The meaning of the Virgin of the Rocks is cryptic. Because Leonardo does not make clear which baby is John 
and which one is Jesus? And the two babies in that painting are almost the same size. And it's not altogether clear <clears throat> which baby is which. Even more mysteriously, this unorthodox scene does not actually appear in biblical scripture. The second child is an addition that Leonardo seems particularly keen to make without much biblical warrant. He has to go to the Apocrypha to find a meeting between the infants. But why would Leonardo use obscure and unofficial Christian texts to justify the inclusion of John the Baptist in his picture? John was Florence's patron saint. To glorify him, the city had built a magnificent baptistry. They decorated its interior with stunning mosaics portraying his life story. Um, it's a very Florentine subject. St. John is a very popular figure, so I think he's producing what in a sense is a not exactly a narrative, but he's relying upon this story which the Florentines liked of uh, Christ meeting St. John in the wilderness as a, as a young baby. But perhaps by deliberately confusing their roles, Leonardo might have been hinting at something deeper. To understand what is a question that leads back to the very origins of Christianity. John the Baptist is venerated in all three of the world's great religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. The forerunner of Christ, he fled to the wilderness and set up a church by the River Jordan, baptizing people into repentance and the forgiveness of sin. In traditional Eastern iconographic portraits, he has disheveled hair and a shaggy beard and his clothing is tattered. He's shouting in the wilderness. He's baptizing people in what to many seems a strange ritual. This is someone who stands out very strongly. I am the voice of the one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. And into this wilderness came the greatest spiritual figure in Western history, Christ. According to the Gospels, Jesus is transformed by John's sacred act of baptism. I saw the Spirit come down as a dove from heaven and rest on him. I have seen and borne witness that he is the Son of God. Like Christ, John the Baptist became a martyr. The Gospels record that Herod Antipas was so delighted by his stepdaughter Salome's dancing that he promised to fulfill her dearest wish the head of John the Baptist. But according to the early historian Josephus, the real reason for his execution was his growing influence and power. The New Testament Gospels portray John the Baptist, of course, as, as a herald of Jesus. But in his own time, uh, John was very well-known preacher and probably much more so, as Josephus suggests, than, than Jesus of Nazareth. In fact, the Gospels have to work hard to downplay the importance of the Baptist in favor of their teacher, Jesus of Nazareth. Could Leonardo be making the shocking and deeply heretical suggestion that John the Baptist was equal in importance to the Messiah himself? The things that are inside these uh, paintings are uh, against the church. For sure, for that period of time, it was heretical. Uh, it was something unacceptable from the common people. The great significance Leonardo gives John the Baptist in his work is the first step in decoding what may be a deeply heretical message within the Holy Babies. The religious confraternity who commissioned the picture didn't own it for very long. Leonardo claimed they hadn't paid for it, but some now suggest the order rejected its heretical theme. But Duke Ludovico Sforza loved it and had it requisitioned for his own collection. The Duke was celebrating 
the problem of the legitimate heir had suddenly gone away, leaving him as undisputed master of Milan. When the young man dies, very suddenly and in great agony, it's assumed that his uncle has poisoned him. Ludovico becomes officially Duke of Milan in 1495, and this prompts yet again another kind of outpouring of commissions designed to celebrate his, his new fixed, secure position. Ludovico now commissioned a series of lavish works, including the painting which would take Leonardo another three years to complete. The Last Supper, a fresco that has long been at the center of speculation about Leonardo's supposed heretical beliefs. By the mid-1490s, Leonardo da Vinci was Milan's most celebrated artist. And owner of the Holy Babies, Robert Berlur, believes that it's to this period and to Leonardo's Milanese studio that the painting can be traced. But was it Leonardo who painted it? He's got a shifting population in the studio of people who come in and go out and do specific jobs, but he's also got a central cadre of people. So you've got these young men who Leonardo trained up, who probably stayed in the studio and did work for him. It's believed that one of Leonardo's pupils, Marco Doggiono, painted this version of the Holy Baby's Kissing. The motif is remarkably similar to Robert's painting. This picture, amongst others, has led scholars to speculate there is a lost Leonardo original, because these young men made copies of most of his work. Is the original 
the one being tested. Dr. Eastor is beginning another series of tests to date the painting. First, he must extract paint samples from the holy babies. It's a controversial technique because it's invasive. And Robert's nephew, Marcus, who has come to oversee the tests, is understandably nervous. If the painting is a priceless Leonardo, this is a huge risk. I can see quite clearly along a crack there's been a certain amount of loss of paint so that we can sample from the edge of that. These microscopic samples are vital for determining the painting's age and will now be sent off to a specialized laboratory for analysis. It's not the only invasive test Robert has authorized. Carbon dating is usually considered the most reliable and authoritative of all dating techniques. A tiny sample is taken from the wooden panel to be analyzed. The results will take weeks to arrive but they should be able to pinpoint whether the picture was painted in Leonardo's lifetime or not. Convinced he can reconstruct the history of the painting, Robert is in Oxford with Professor Kemp with the next piece of the provenance puzzle. So far, the painting seems to have come from Leonardo's patron, Duke Ludovico, to his vengeful grandniece, Lucrezia d'Este, and from her, to her family's sworn enemy, Cardinal Pietro Aldo Brandini. But how did it get to England? How do we get from Aldo Brandini, where the painting is definitely there, it's sitting in the palace number 39, to Britain in the 18th century? What, what are the steps well, Beckford, there? Beckford went to, had to, went to the... William Beckford, nicknamed Kitty, was an English aristocrat whose homosexuality scandalized society. And Robert has found that Beckford brought back a picture fitting the description of the Holy Babies from Italy. Beckford was a great collector of paintings. And in fact, his letters often make reference to Leonardo's. And he longed to buy a Leonardo da Vinci for the grace and sweetness of its boys. Oh, what melting eyes the putty have. Oh, ah, oh. So really, Beckford did uh, like pictures of, of young boys. William Beckford's Kissing Babies was sold to an art dealer in 1807 as a Leonardo. But then the trail goes cold. If Beckford's painting were the same picture of the Holy Babies, where has it been for the past two centuries? Robert has no provable answer. The painting's authentication will have to rely on other means. The picture has arrived at a laboratory in Surrey. Given the worth of Leonardo's paintings, the next step of the scientific investigation is the most risky yet. This massive machine is a particle accelerator. Ordinarily, it's used to examine anything from stardust to silicon chips. But today, it will use a technique called PIXI, or proton-induced X-ray emission, on the holy babies. What we're doing with the painting is that we're firing particles at about a tenth the speed of light and looking at how they bounce off it so that we can get an idea of all elements above something like sodium in the periodic table. PIXI can tell Dr. Eastor the elemental composition of the pigments and from that information, he can work out where they came from. We have lots of copper on the, in the flowers. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's very interesting. I mean, typically we'd find those high levels of copper in southern European lead whites. So clearly, with the copper present, it's what we would expect. In the Italian painting, we've got Italian produced lead white. The scientific net is drawing closer all the time. The tests have confirmed that the painting originated in Italy.
When Robert bought the painting in 1978, it was attributed to a pupil of Gian Petrino, who in turn was a pupil of Leonardo. And Gian Petrino did his own copying for the master. Most notably, he copied and helped to paint one of Leonardo's most famous works, The Last Supper. The Last Supper was revolutionary. Never had such famous biblical figures been painted to seem so alive, naturalistic, and fully human. And the mural's symbology, its ambiguous motifs, have been the subject of endless speculation. Most famously, that the beardless disciple John sat beside Christ is really Mary Magdalene. Inevitably, the art establishment has poured scorn over such ideas. If we look at Leonardo's notebooks, there is no evidence at all of any systematic heretical beliefs. He believes in God, he believes God is the supreme creator, but what he can do is to prove how God operates on Earth. So I think his career is spent proving how God operates in nature and Earth, and I think he's not at all interested in all this mystical stuff. But Leonardo was forced to leave both his masterpiece and his studio behind. Political events were about to shatter his world. In 1499, the French invaded Milan. Duke Ludovico fled, but was eventually captured and died in prison. Without a patron, Leonardo decided to leave Milan in search of a new one. He found one of the most despotic, charismatic, and ruthless military rulers in history. The illegitimate son of Pope Alexander VI, Cesare Borgia. Cesare Borgia is a kind of bandit figure who becomes, through his own opportunism, a byword for power divested of any ethical or religious constraint, power as realpolitik, without any trappings or excuses. In 1502, Leonardo entered Cesare's service as a military engineer, and while the Duke threatened his former home city of Florence, Leonardo designed the weaponry. It was an unusual move for an artist who documented his personal attitude to war as the most brutal kind of madness there is. Yet for many months he accompanied Cesare's troops, designing new and ever more ingenious solutions to his military problems. Leonardo has a very ambiguous attitude to war. He, on one hand, is fascinated by the power of war. If you're an engineer and you're interested in force and power, there is nothing bigger than military engineering. Leonardo stayed only a short time in the service of the dangerous and unpredictable Cesare Borgia. When he eventually returned to Milan, he was in his 50s. His first piece of business was to resolve a long-standing court case, the Virgin of the Rocks, begun 25 years earlier. Leonardo completed a second version of the painting. This is now housed in the National Gallery, London. Professor Kemp has brought the Holy Babies to the gallery to compare the two paintings. Such detailed comparisons are an essential element of art connoisseurship. They're incredibly interesting together. This picture stands up pretty well. And it's a nicely made picture and sometimes you would put a picture like this beside something which is certified a Leonardo and it would look horrible and that hasn't happened, <laughs> I'm pleased to say. This is good news. 
Ultimately, the painting stands or falls on Professor Kemp's assessment. When Leonardo painted or drew anything, he really got a sense of the inner life of the form. If you look at the way Leonardo drew and painted hair, it seems to have a kind of life of its own. And it's that sense that the object itself almost has a living presence. Professor Kemp's analysis will rely on key details in the painting, the hallmarks of Leonardo's genius. It's a complex process and uh, there is no sort of rigid formula for it. I would also look rather hard at something which is very characteristic of Leonardo, how he handles plants. That plant, um, with its three-dimensional flowers, its foreshortening, the folding over of the leaves, does actually stand up very well um, beside the plants in the bottom left-hand corner. This second depiction of the Virgin of the Rocks is also an important clue in deciphering the meaning of the painting. There are subtle differences between the two versions. In this one, a reed cross and halos were added in after Leonardo completed it, clearly identifying the baby on the left as John the Baptist. John the Baptist is shown with his attribute of a reed cross, but he's also made that much bigger than Christ, therefore he is the older baby, therefore he is John the Baptist, and therefore not Christ. The difference between the two paintings has allowed some scholars to uncover a radically new interpretation of the ideas behind them. A theory that suggests the artist may have been symbolizing something far more plausible than the Da Vinci Code. Gnosticism. We know for sure that Leonardo owns some Gnostic books. From that book he gets some maybe strange ideas, and he reports these kind of ideas in his first paint of the Madonna of the Rocks. Because for Leonardo, Jesus Christ is a common man, like everyone. The idea that Jesus was a common, ordinary man is a deeply Gnostic belief. The term Gnostic comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge, but it doesn't mean intellectual knowledge. Gnosis means knowledge in relationship, knowledge of the heart. Though there were many different sects, they all shared a core belief, that inside humans is a spark of supreme divinity, which can be discovered through contemplation and self-knowledge. Gnosticism could easily have become the theological basis for Christianity if one second century Gnostic priest and won his election to become Bishop of Rome, the office of the Pope. Valentinus was born in Alexandria in 100 AD. A devout Christian and a Gnostic, he sought to reconcile the two creeds. Valentinus is a man of enormous impact in the early Christian world, but we know that he was ousted from this Roman Christian community and became, in a sense, the great arch-heretic of the time period. Valentinus's influence led to a growth of Gnostic schools, which in time would represent a major threat to mainstream Christianity. And indeed, when you look at the right, his dismissal from Rome are violently against his teaching. They very often present radically different readings of the creation account, radically different readings of what Christ meant by certain statements. Unlike the church, Gnostics believed that the virgin birth and even the resurrection did not happen physically. It was a metaphor for a spiritual awakening. They never accepted the resurrection of the flesh and bone body of Jesus. They accepted the resurrection of the spirit. They believe that Jesus has a double nature, a spiritual nature, and a flesh and bone one. Gnostics also practiced a form of baptism which they believed to be greater than the washing away of sin. Through this higher baptism, a spark of inner divinity was awakened an idea that would become deeply heretical and threaten to undermine the authority of the church. One of the things that leaders of the church in the early communities found very threatening 
was the claim on the part of certain Christian teachers that they could give you a higher level of baptism or a different ritual that would indicate your spiritual level had advanced. Um, that suggests that what the Catholic Church could offer is somehow either inadequate or at least limited. But is there any evidence that Leonardo was familiar with these advanced teachings? An extraordinary recent discovery seems to confirm that Leonardo's pupils were. It's a picture by Bernardino Luini, which depicts John the Baptist blessing two children, Jesus and his double, the earthly and heavenly Christ. The theme is seemingly Gnostic. This painting was recently discovered and it is important, especially from an iconographic point of view, because it links to Gnostic texts. One key Gnostic text, suppressed by the early church, seems to provide a link to the holy babies. The Gospel of Philip speaks in detail of the higher baptism. Philip describes it as taking the form of a mystical kiss. Was Leonardo aware of this distinctive Gnostic idea when he painted the holy babies? But then did Leonardo even paint it?
the investigation to discover if the Holy Babies is a genuine Leonardo da Vinci is almost complete. So far, analysis has proved that the Holy Babies motif originated in Leonardo's workshop. But was it devised by Leonardo himself? And who painted it? Although Martin Kemp is totally dismissive about Leonardo's association with Gnostic ideas, he's nevertheless eager to discover if the artist did originate the motif for the painting. In the Windsor collection, a series of Leonardo sketches, he finds a tiny drawing of two children kissing. There's a page at Windsor um, which is mainly pupils' drawings. Well, it's all said to be all pupils' drawings, but I've looked again at the drawing in the bottom right-hand corner, and I think it's absolutely Leonardo. It's simply not the pupils' work. It's drawn very quickly, very spontaneously. It's drawn left-handed. You can see the left hand is shading. It even hooks back at the end. So I think we've reinstated a drawing. This is now, I think, on the sheet of pupils' work, is Leonardo doing a little sketch, which is the sketch which says that this motif of the children crossing is a Leonardo motif. It's a hugely significant find. The motif of the Holy Babies belongs to Leonardo. It's his original design. But is it his original painting? If there is one test that can find the artist, it's this one. Fingerprint analysis. Canadian Paul Biro is a forensic art detective. It's his work of fingerprint analysis which recently authenticated a Jackson Pollock and a Turner. But this is the first time he's worked on what may be a Leonardo. Yeah, there is definitely a fingerprint here. That seems original to the painting. First, Biro compares the fingerprint from the Holy Babies with a fingerprint from a sketch of the Last Supper. Then he compares the two for similarities. It's a difficult process. The 500-year-old prints are not of the highest quality. There is this bifurcation here on the left-hand side on A. There is this bifurcation here on the right-hand side. So this is a very good start. Slowly, a series of matching characteristics emerges for the two fingerprints. I have found eight matching characteristics. The final proof of their similarity relies on removing the prints themselves to expose the locations of the matching characteristics. As you can see, they line up extremely well. Orange is the fingerprint from the Leonardo drawing and the blue is the picture under examination here. For me, this is a beautiful match. What will the team make of this revelatory evidence? Because in the art world, fingerprint analysis is controversial. The age and quality of the prints makes it an inexact science. Gathered for the final assessment, a Dr. Eastor and Professor Kemp, who is assisted by Professor Marina Wallace. The experts don't know it, but next door, Robert and his nephew are watching the entire process. How old is the picture? The first scientific clue was the lead tin yellow pigment used in the hair of the babies. A crucial one is lead tin yellow. It's a very powerful date indicator pigment for us. So to have lead tin yellow in this painting already takes us back to the 17th century. But will the carbon dating of the panel indicate that it comes from Leonardo's era? We've got a 63% probability that it's between 1446-1524. More excellent news for Robert. The next question is did the pixie analysis reveal it to be from the right location? So the copper to silver ratio in these white flowers is high, so we're talking about a Southern European, I mean, in this case, essentially Italian painting. The picture is from the right time and place. But will Dr. Eastor's detailed study of the underdrawing give any stylistic hints that it's a genuine Leonardo? 
the overall layer structure is very, very simple. This sort of blockiness looks more like the way a copyist might paint it. Despite this potentially devastating news, there is one more final piece of evidence that could change everything. The fingerprint analysis. I have found eight matching characteristics. For me, this is a beautiful match. The surprising bit of evidence, of course, was the fingerprint of, uh, of seeing this fingerprint, which also appears in that drawing in Venice. And uh, if I accept the fingerprint evidence, then that's very exciting. And what that does, it locates the picture within the Leonardo circle. For Robert and his nephew, Marcus, this is an incredible moment. The painting has now been narrowed down to Leonardo's own workshop. But the multi-million dollar question remains, is it a genuine Leonardo? This picture is very good and it does all the Leonardo things well, but for me it hasn't quite got that uh, tingle factor, as it were. We're dealing with something which is a product, and the product is called Leonardo. Using his designs, and we only have uh, now, I think, one prime version of this picture. The other versions are not as good. So I think this is the inner circle one, which is probably the, the best of these, these products. Professor Kemp's assessment is that the Holy Babies is an authorized Leonardo painting by one of his gifted pupils. But the fact it originates from Leonardo's own studio and is based on Leonardo's own design has vastly increased its value and importance that he put it already into the vicinity of Leonardo is wonderful. Finally, after 28 years of painstaking effort, Robert can enter the upper echelons of the art market with a painting proven to be from Leonardo's own workshop. But Robert's wonderful news is soon thrown in doubt when the unthinkable happens. Shortly after giving his analysis, Professor Kemp modified his views. The fingerprint evidence came at the last minute and it needs further assessment. It needs further assessment in relation to the Venice drawing, which I believe is not by Leonardo. Though the authorship of this drawing is disputed, the Academy in Venice that owns it attributes it to Leonardo. But even without the fingerprint evidence, Professor Kemp still believes that the picture is from Leonardo's own studio. I think it's a very, very good picture. I'm happy to accept that it's part of the Leonardo production system. After almost three decades of struggling against the art establishment, Robert is unfazed. Yes, I still think it's a Leonardo. It has all the aspects of a Leonardo. Perhaps a future assessment of the Holy Babies will one day prove him right. But what seems certain now is that the motif found in the Windsor collection is Leonardo's. It leaves a final and highly contentious question. What does it mean? Professor Kemp considers his view representative of the art establishment. The Gnostic interpretation of the Holy Babies is, to put it bluntly, nonsense. There is no evidence that Leonardo had any interest in Gnostic doctrine at all. And indeed, everything we know about Leonardo suggests he would have been deeply unsympathetic to them. Whilst many experts share Professor Kemp's view that Leonardo wasn't personally a Gnostic, there is in fact a growing body of opinion by some of the world's most eminent Leonardo scholars that there may be Gnostic influences in his art. the art world will continue to debate the meaning of Leonardo's mysterious works. As will the conspiracy theorists. But Leonardo himself remains an enigma. When he died in 1519, he left an immense body of thought spanning fields as diverse as science, anatomy, engineering and design. But on religion, he was uncharacteristically silent. Yet the Holy Babies, with its seemingly Gnostic iconography, perhaps offers us a clue that the man widely regarded as the greatest genius in history believed true divinity lies within the heart 
of man. <laughs>